on the behalf of the nation of Israel and to uh, let your dominion release help on their behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Am I on here? Praise God. Praise God. We'll receive God's tithe and offering if you're giving tonight. We'll do that at the end of the service. I want to go into um, a teaching that I started on my last Sunday night here about the anointing and the assignment for the anointing. And there were some things that we covered that we may not be able to, to touch on again and some that we may visit portions of it. We talked about what the anointing is, and I would like to revisit uh, Isaiah chapter 10, and, and let's pick up with our, our foundational scripture here and um, see the importance of the anointing in our lives. Isaiah 10 and verse 27 is the verse that we uh, are are given a description of the working of the anointing through. It says in verse 27 of Isaiah 10, it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away, talking about the enemy's burden, shall be taken away from off your shoulder and his yoke from off your neck and the yoke shall be destroyed not broken, it says destroyed here. Yes. Destroyed, the word means to annihilate, to obliterate. His, the yoke shall be annihilated. The yoke shall be obliterated because of the anointing. Because of the anointing. So we see that the anointing works to destroy what once held someone in bondage or captivity. That's one of the things that we want to see. And then uh, I want to take us to Jesus. And uh, let's look at Luke chapter four. Luke chapter four. Verse 18, Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. So the anointing is a term that is used synonymous with the Holy Spirit. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is how he's describing how God has anointed him. The spirit is upon me. So you'll often see the word anointing making reference to the presence of the Holy Spirit upon that person. The word anoint in its simplest form means to um, smear or to rub all over, to smear. So when they would anoint people with oil, they would pour that oil on them. They would smear that oil on them. But we're not anointed with natural oil. We are anointed with the Spirit of God. So the anointing on the New Testament believer is the same as the anointing that Jesus is referring to here. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Jesus is the anointed one. The word Christ is not Jesus' last name. The word Christ is a term that describes his position as the anointed one, and it refers in the same definition as the anointing upon him. So we could define Christ as the anointed one and his anointing. So when we say Christ in you, the hope of glory, we're saying the anointed one and his anointing in you. 
When we say, if any man be in Christ, we're saying, if any man be in the anointed one and in his anointing, hallelujah. So Christ is not Jesus last name as we have last names. It was the title or the position that Jesus holds as the anointed one. All of the anointing that God possesses has been poured out on Christ. And again, remember I said, the anointing is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, he said, he has received, let's look at Acts when Peter is preaching about Jesus having poured out the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, he says in Acts chapter 2, hallelujah, verse 33, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. So he was exalted at the right hand of the Father. We would say glorified, right? At the right hand of the Father. Do you remember in John chapter seven when Jesus said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water? This he spake of the spirit who had not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So Jesus being glorified or exalted at the right hand of the Father has received the promise of the Father. That's what he said in Acts one to his disciples, tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you receive the promise of the Father because I baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. That's the promise of the Father, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. And so he has received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit He had, so who received the promise of the Holy Spirit? Jesus has received the fullness of the Spirit. Jesus has received the fullness of the Spirit. The fullness of the anointing. He is the anointed one. All of the anointing that God possesses has been poured out upon Jesus. He he is the anointed one his anointing is included in that description of that word Christ. He has received of the Father and he has shed forth this, which you now see and hear. What were they seeing and hearing? They were seeing people under the influence of the Holy Spirit speaking in other tongues. They heard them speak in other tongues. So Jesus has been given the fullness of the Spirit and he has poured out on, on his body of that fullness. So any anointing any of us have originates from him and cannot be held outside of him. There's no anointing for someone outside of Jesus. They're not operating in the anointing outside of a relationship because to get this anointing, it has to come through my connection to him in the body. Amen? Amen? So Psalm 133 talks, it's a a scripture that we use often in praying about uh, the unity that God wants to develop and to progress as our vision expands. He says, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And then he begins to talk about the anointing. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard Oh, 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 now we know whose beard? Even Aaron's beard. Well, Aaron is the high priest. So we're talking about the high priest anointing. Who's our high priest? Jesus. Jesus. So he's talking about unity in the brethren, and he begins to describe the anointing, and he said the anointing that runs down from the head, down the beard, even Aaron's beard, all the way down to the skirts of his garment. So the anointing flows through the body. The anointing on Jesus, the head, doesn't stay on Jesus, reserved only for Jesus. It flows through the body, through the body, through the whole body, from the head, down the beard, even down to the skirts of his garments. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So every believer has anointing available. Glory. Glory to God. And as we yield to the baptism in the Holy Spirit, receive this baptism in the Holy Spirit, then we begin to learn how to flow with the anointing. Hallelujah. That's, that's the, the, when we see the purpose of the anointing, when we see the working of the anointing, when we see the value of the anointing, then we'll begin to grow in our understanding of the purpose and the working of the anointing so that we can cooperate, so that we can participate. That's what God wants for every one of us, to participate with his anointing, to flow with his power, to be people who come together ready to connect like that brethren who dwell together in unity and let the anointing flow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In our last session, we talked about that connection and we talked about how David's mighty men did not stay the way that they came to him originally. When they came to him in the cave of Dullam, they were in distress. They were discontented. They were in debt. But they connected to David. Yeah. Now, David's anointing, we saw how it worked. The anointing that God put on David to make David king, we saw David king. I said, didn't mean to make David king. Forgive me, sir. <laughs> to, to make to make David become king, Amen. right? When we, when we see that anointing upon him, we see it operating, giving him victory over any type of adversity that came against him. I mean, supernatural victory. He, he after the anointing came upon him, he went back out to the field. He went at, back out to what he was doing before, but he began to respond differently. A bear came out and he did something. I, I just have to imagine yeah. that after he killed the bear with his, his hands, yeah. after he grabbed the lion and smote him, yeah. I mean, uh, grab a lion by the beard? Yeah. You just have to wonder when the anointing lifted if he had an Urkel moment. Right. <laughs> did I do that? Yeah. I mean, did he, when the anointing lifted... Yeah. Did he, did he wonder, what happened to me? Why did I go after a bear? Why did I grab a lion by its mane? Why did I do that? Did you, I mean, I just have to wonder. Yeah. But regardless of what he thought after the anointing lifted, while the anointing was upon him, he had a holy indignation. Yes. He had a supernatural ability to overcome yeah. that adversity. No matter how big the bear was, no matter how ferocious the lion was, when he stood out in the field and all of the soldiers who had been trained from their youth to fight were hiding in their tents, David, he was indignant. Are you going to let him talk like that? Are you going to let that that giant insult and blaspheme our God? Oh, no, no, you don't. Oh, no. And he began to voice his indignation and said, I will go out and fight him. That was the anointing of God. The anointing God had placed upon him to come into that place of authority, to, to move into that role as king and, and defend the nation of God. Well, when, the, when those men came and joined themselves to him in the cave, they began to have similar descriptions of their victories in battle. They began to experience some of that same uh, supernatural uh, standing and supernatural confrontation against the enemy forces. I mean, here's a man who stood and fought for lentils. He stood in his pea patch and said, I'm not going to let them steal my peas another day. Now you've got to be quite a hungry man to fight for, 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 for peas, for, pen, for lentils, right? For a patch of beans. But it was the anointing that gave him that supernatural stamina and victory to overcome. Yeah. And then we see 
them in the offering, that great offering that was taken for the house, the temple of the tabernacle of God, that, was, that David was preparing all of the resources for Solomon to build it. And these men who came to him to, at the cave in debt, they were now some of the biggest givers into this offering. So the anointing had prospered them. It had prospered them in battle. It had prospered them in their finances. And that anointing came upon them as they connected. Hallelujah. So we recognize that same concept here in Psalm 133. He said, this connection, this unity, how brethren dwell together in unity, that's how the anointing flows. That's how the anointing flows. As we come together in unity of vision, as we have the, have, have the commitment to the assignment God gave our pastor, just like they were committed to the assignment that God gave David, we are committed to the assignment that God gave our pastor to build people's faith, to frame people's world by the word of God, to build a spiritual production center, city, state, nation, and world. Hallelujah. That, that assignment has an anointing to be, to be able to fulfill it. And it will profit our lives. It will not only work for us in the ministry as we come and bring our supply to the house of God, but it will work for us in our life. It will also flow over into our life, into our finances, into our marriages, into our relationships with our families, giving us that same stability and that same, uh, uh, that same anointing. Why? Because that's the plan of God for this, this anointing to flow through the body, from the head all the way through the body. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we also talked about in the past how the anointing is for a purpose. And I want to revisit a little bit of that as well. Let's look again at Joshua and Moses. Let's look again. I want to look specifically at Numbers 27. And we'll begin in verse 18. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand upon him. Now, at this point in the story, if you will, we've already seen how Joshua has been involved in the assignment that God gave Moses. He has been referred to in a, simil, in a, a previous verse as the minister of Moses. He was there with Moses when Moses went up to the mount to receive the, the uh, tablets uh, from God, the commandments of God. He was right outside there on the halfway up the mountain. He was waiting for Moses to come back down when the people were in the camp. Uh, creating the golden calf, right? And so Moses and, and Joshua was so uh, close to the assignment of Moses that when Moses uh, had gone into the tabernacle, Joshua, he was there. He didn't want to leave the tabernacle, right? He, so we see he was sold on it. He was committed to it. He was a part of bringing the people into the promised land. And, and now... He was even when Aaron and her were holding the hands of Moses during that battle, it was Joshua on the front lines leading the troops into the battle. So Joshua has already been a part. His, the spirit of God, it says, a man in whom is the spirit and lay your hand upon him. So we see that as God prepares to impart anointings and, and even uh, greater impartations of an anointing for a specific assignment that he's not going to look for someone who's not involved. He's not going to look for someone who's not committed. He's not going to look from someone outside the camp to put an anointing on them and bring them in. He's looking for people who've already been working in that anointing and working in that assignment, being faithful the faithful shall abound with blessings. Yeah. Amen. He's looking for someone who's already got their hands involved in the work of that ministry. Yeah. He says, take Joshua, 
a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand upon him. Set him before Eliezer the priest and before all the congregation and give him a charge in their sight. And you shall put some of your honor upon him. That's a way to reference the anointing. Some, that, that it was the anointing upon Moses that was giving him that ability to lead, that honor to lead. He says, put some of your honor upon him that all the children of Israel, the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. And he shall stand before Eliezer the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord. At his word shall they go out, and at his word shall they come in, both he and all the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and he took Joshua and set him before Eliezer the priest and before all the congregation, and he laid his hands upon him and gave him a charge as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. So we see this as an equipping. He is transmitting that law of transmission, uh, contact and transmission as he lays his hands and he places upon him some of what has been upon himself. Now, if we look now at Deuteronomy 34 and verse 9, we see a follow-up to that, that occasion. And in this follow-up, it says, Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of of the spirit of wisdom for, or you could say because, or as a result of Moses having laid his hands upon him. So when he laid his hands upon him, there was an, a release, an impartation yeah. of the anointing that gave Joshua this anointing, the spirit of wisdom to lead the people of God. Amen. Hallelujah. So do we see the anointing is for the assignment and the anointing is an equipping? Uh, I want to show us a New Testament reference as well. 1 Timothy 4. Again, the anointing is a, a term that is synonymous with the Holy Spirit coming upon the anointing is also synonym, synonymous with the power of God, we could say. 1 Timothy 4, and we'll read verse 14. Neglect not the gift that is in you, which was given you. A gift that's in you, that was given you. How was it given? By prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery, or that's a, a reference for leaders, for, for people who are in a position of authority. He says, this gift was given, this gift that's in you was given, this was an impartation, and he says, don't neglect it. It's a spiritual supply. It's a spiritual impartation. Don't neglect it. So this anointing, we have a part in its operation in our life. It's possible to neglect the gift. Yeah. It's possible to receive of the anointing. And, and I'll say this, every person who connects to the church body, the local church, has access to the pastor's anointing. But how many neglect it? How many neglect it? I mean, every person who has committed themselves to be a part of this church can come in here and draw on that anointing on that pastor's office and say, I need help. I need some answers. And I'm not, not demanding of the man, but coming and sitting in the service and saying, Lord, I'm expecting answers from the office of the pastor, the anointing that's on his, the office he stands in. I'm drawing the supply that I need. Why? Because you've placed a pastor in my life to feed me. You've placed a pastor in my life to give me a spiritual provision and a spiritual supply. How many people neglect that provision? Yeah. Yeah. Lack of knowledge <clears throat> is probably the, the most prominent reason they do. Yeah. They don't know that they, they don't know how to, to place a demand mm -hmm. on that. 
And, and so I'm going to tell you, in case you don't know, I just want you to go ahead and somebody might need to hear this later and they'll, they'll listen to it and then they'll know, right? Yeah. You place a demand on it by, the, how do you do anything by faith with the heart and with the mouth? You say, Lord, I believe that there's a supply, a spiritual provision in the office of the pastor. When I go to church, I, I expect to receive answers. Yeah. I expect Amen. to receive strength that I need. I re- expect to receive something. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. So believe it and say it. And then come expecting. Come and listen with the intent that there's going to be answers for me. There's going to be a spiritual supply. It may not be, thus saith the Lord, kind of an answer, but it might be in the middle of a rabbit trail that he did not intend to take, saying something he did not intend to say. That's a divine rescue for you. Yeah. So... When we know that there's a supply, that anointing is available in that office, then we can place that demand on it. And so if we have connected to the church, if we're if we've connected to the church with our service, with, with our, our commitment to put our hands to the work of the ministry, and I'm looking around, and, and most everybody I see here, y'all, were, y'all are connected in some way, in some fashion, in some form, doing something in the church. There's a supply for you that's even beyond just that supply that every sheep has from the pastor. Why? Because now I'm like that one who came to the cave of Dulham. I'm helping the vision be fulfilled. I'm putting my hands to the front door to welcome people as they come in. I'm putting my hands to run the cameras. I'm putting my hands to to lead the worship. I'm putting my hands to teach the youth or the children, whatever the case may be, whatever you're putting your hand to do. Now, now, you take your faith and and pull on that supply. The same anointing that you placed upon my pastor to build people's faith and frame their worlds is working in me, and it will work in me as I build my marriage, as I build my finances, as I build my physical health. I, I I lay my faith and draw on it. Hallelujah. But notice it says you don't neglect it, but... Let's also read what else you can do where that's concerned. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 6. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 6. He says, Wherefore I put you in remembrance that you stir up the gift of God, which is in you by the putting on of my hands. He's reminding Timothy. He said, I, I'm, I'm reminding you, stir up up the gift. Stir up the anointing that's been imparted to you. Stir up that impartation of that supply. Stir it up. Hallelujah. 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 Stir up the gift. Hallelujah. So not only am I not to neglect it, I am instructed not to neglect the gift but I'm told to stir up the gift. Stir up that gift. Hallelujah. Jesus was stirring up something when he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me. He was stirring something up. He was making a declaration. Yes, he was was preaching the Christ and his anointing. He was preaching, I am the anointed one and the anointing is, of God is upon me. And he went everywhere preaching that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But as he's preaching it, as he's declaring it, he's stirring something up. Hallelujah. So we see that the anointing flows through the connection of unity. We see that the anointing is an equipping, an impartation that can be neglected or can be uh, attended to. It is an impartation that can be stirred up. Amen. Hallelujah. When um, Elijah and Elisha, we talked a little bit about them last time. Let's go back and visit it again because faith comes by hearing and hearing. So 1 Kings 19, let's 
Let's begin in verse 19. I'll actually begin in verse 15. Let's let's go to 15 first. The Lord said unto him, to Elijah, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you are come, anoint Haziel to be the king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shall you anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall you anoint to be prophet in your room. So we see here that the anointing, there was an anointing for the king. There was anointing for the prophet. And he said, for him to stand in your room, he will need that anointing. For him to stand in your office, he will need that anointing. So he, he, he identified that these specific people to be recipients of the anointing for them to fulfill an assignment. To fulfill an assignment. So you could say here that Jehu couldn't take this anointing to be king and go do something else with it. Right? Could he take that anointing and say, I don't want to do this. Would it work for something else? Would it work for him to be a fisherman? Would it work for him to to be a farmer? No, that anointing is for the assignment. And the anointing of Jesus, because all the anointing we have originates from him, the anointing, He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach. He's anointed me to set at liberty them that are bruised. He's anointed me to declare, hallelujah, good tidings. He's anointed me for these specific assignments. Hallelujah. Now, verse 19, so he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he was uh, with the 12th, and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, I pray you, uh, let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, go back again for what have I done to you? And he returned back from him took a yoke of oxen, slew them, boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen. In other words, I won't need these oxen anymore because I'm not coming back. I'm not going to leave an open door for me to come back in case this prophet thing doesn't work out, you know. In other words, I'm all in. I'm committed to what he's asking me to do. I'm committed to this assignment. I won't need the 12 oxen anymore. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered to him. Hallelujah. So, you know, when we saw Joshua, he was already a person who was involved. He was working when God promoted him, you could say, when God found that faithfulness in him. Elijah found Elisha laboring responsible for 12 yoke of oxen. That's quite a responsibility, right? So he didn't find somebody... Uh, sitting on the dock of the bay, (laughs) letting the time waste away, right? He didn't find somebody sitting on the creek bank, drowned in some worms or something, right? He found somebody who was, had a responsibility, who, who was uh, putting their hands to a task and maintaining that responsibility. When he found David, David was a shepherd. When Jesus found his disciples, they were fishermen, he, he found people who would, would be willing to get the job done. Hallelujah. And he found you. Aren't you glad that he counted you faithful, putting you in the ministry? Glory to God. Glory to God. So what we see here is this uh, anointing was for the purpose. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not going to go into today that... Um, 
double portion and, and how he stayed committed to that. I want to take a different look today. Let's go to 1 Samuel and let me see uh, how we can glean some nuggets from 1 Samuel chapter 10 because we see a process. 1 Samuel chapter 10 and actually, let me back up to chapter 9 and just pick up verses 15 and 16. 9, 15. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow, about this time, I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be captain over my people Israel." that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines, for I have looked upon my people because their cry is come to me. So notice there was an appointed time for this impartation, for this anointing. There was a time that God had on his calendar. He said, tomorrow about this time. Saul had no idea. Saul wasn't in on this. Saul was responsible. He had lost his father's donkeys and he's out looking for his father's donkeys he thinks that's what he's doing. He thinks he's trying to recover something that has been lost, but his footsteps are leading him into this appointment that God has for him, this assignment that God has for him. And so he says, tomorrow, the Lord says, tomorrow about this time, you shall anoint him to be captain over my people. Now let's go to chapter 10 and verse one, and let's look at this anointing. This, this process of how, how this anointing operated on Saul. It says in verse one, Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his, speaking of Saul's, poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, is it not because the Lord has anointed you to be captain over his inheritance? Now, again, Saul doesn't realize that this is the first he's hearing about the matter. He, he says, I, I'm here to find my, my father's lost donkeys. And they say, the donkeys have been found. Word has come that the donkeys have been found. But while you're here, let me tell you why you're really here. And he pours the oil, the anointing on him and declares over him, I am anointing you to be the captain over the Lord's inheritance. So now Saul has to receive this anointing. He has to receive it. And then it says in verse two, when you are departed from me today, you shall find two men by Rachel's sepulcher in the border of Benjamin at Zelza. And they will say unto you, the donkeys that you went to seek are found. And lo, your father has left the care of the donkeys and now sorrows for you saying, what shall I do for my son? Hallelujah. So he's no longer missing what he thought he was missing. He's no longer broken in the areas he thought he was broken in. There has been a supernatural restoration that has taken place to prepare him to hold or to be a carrier of this anointing. Amen. Hallelujah. And so we've got to receive, not only receive the anointing for what God is calling us to do, the assignment that he's calling us to do, but we need to let his grace restore those areas areas of brokenness so that we can walk full of the anointing and not be leaky vessels. Hallelujah. So that we can carry, be carriers of what he's deposited. So this supernatural restoration must occur for you to retain your impartation. Verse three takes another step. Then you shall go on forward from there, from that place of restoration. And you shall come to the plain of Tabor, and there shall meet you three men going up to God to Bethel, one carrying three kids, donkey, or three goats, and another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a bottle of wine. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He, he, so he's, he's moving forward and there's going to be a, a restoration. He's moving forward another step and we see a supernatural progress, a provision of God. There's going to be a provision and they will salute you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall receive of their hands. You're going to receive this provision 
this provision you didn't ask for. Why? It's the anointing that's bringing the provision to you. Do you remember those men who joined themselves to David who became some of the biggest givers next to David into the work of God, yeah. where did they get that, that provision? Where did they come by this, this increase in their life? It was the anointing that brought them into the plan, that brought them into the assignment of God, that, that equipped them in the assignment of God and spilled over into their lives to bring a supply. So he said, they will salute you. That's an honor that's a, a recognition they will recognize and they will give you provision. Hallelujah. 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 God says if the blessing, he'll make your name great. God said when he blesses you, he's going to make your name great. Yes. That belongs to every one of you. Yes. That God will make your name great in your employment, in your circles, in your sphere of influence. God wants to make your name great. Hallelujah. So the anointing will cause you to be saluted. It will cause you to be noticed and you will have this supernatural provision. Verse five, after that, you shall come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines. And it shall come to pass when you are come there to the city, that you shall meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery. Now, are we talking about some supernatural divine connections here? You're going to meet this person you're going to meet this person here every step of the way. The anointing is leading and connecting. Amen. He said this company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery, with a tabret, with a pipe, a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. Hallelujah. They shall prophesy. And the spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you will prophesy with them. Saul had never prophesied. He was looking for lost donkeys. He, he just came out, I'm just here to get some lost donkeys. But now the anointing is upon him and the assignment for that, uh, that the anointing is for is placed before him. And now God is supernaturally leading him. And it says, the spirit of the Lord will come on you and you shall prophesy with them and you shall be turned into another man. Because the anointing causes supernatural change of status. Yeah. God's word is able to prophesy into your future and that anointing begins to change you from the inside out. Anybody ever had, had can look back to your life when you connected to the anointing? I know many of you that we talked about this at, in our last session, many of you connected uh, to Agape and to Pastor Caldwell years ago, and you can see the same semblance of how the stability in the Caldwells is in your family. You can see how the same stability in the finances of the Caldwells is now operating in your finances. You can see how the wisdom that was on your pastor began to operate in your life and on your job. Why? Because you connected to the anointing and an anointing caused a change of status. It changed Amen. you from the inside out. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is what God wants to do. Verse seven, let it be when these signs are come unto you that you do as occasion serve you for God is with you. That's the whole essence of the anointing. God is with you. The Bible says that how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, God anointed him. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed. Why? Because God was with him. How was he with him? He anointed him. And when he anointed him, he became with him. How, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, who went about doing good. How God anointed Tracy Brown. How God anointed Andre. How God anointed Wanda. How God anointed Gloria. And, and, and Gloria went about teaching children the goodness of God, for God was with her. How God anointed uh, Minister King, and Minister King went about doing good and leading people into the presence of God, for God was with him. Amen. Hallelujah. What we're doing, we're doing it with God. We're doing it for him, but we're, we're not doing it on our own for him. Yeah. We're doing it with him. He's with us in the anointing. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. 
And you shall go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and sacrifices, sacrifice, sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shall you tarry till I come to you, and I will show you what to do. There will be supernatural direction for you in the anointing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the Holy Spirit comes upon us for a purpose in the same way we see the Holy Spirit coming upon Joshua to lead the children of Israel, coming upon uh, Moses, coming upon Elisha, Elijah, coming upon David, coming upon those who were working with David. The anointing came upon them for a purpose and the anointing comes upon us for a purpose. I want to read a quote to you from John G. Lake. This is uh, something that the Holy Spirit, actually this is like a prophecy. That it's the Holy Spirit spoke through John G. Lake in 1916. The triumph of Jesus Christ was attained by his willingness to be led by the Spirit of God. The triumph of a Christian can be attained only in a similar manner. Even though God has baptized a soul with the Holy Spirit, there yet remains, as with Jesus, the present necessity of walking in humility and permitting the Spirit of God to be his absolute guide. He who would understand the ways of God must trust the Spirit's power to guide and keep. So the anointing, the anointing is an equipping, but we want the Holy Spirit to guide us in how we yield to and respond to and operate in the anointing. We see Jesus working with the Holy Spirit. Let's look at Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter four. Now, Jesus, the very first sermon that we have of him preaching is what we read earlier, Luke four, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. I'm just gonna go back to it because I want to point something out. Hold your place here in Matthew four and go back to Luke four. When it says here, In verse 18, notice it says in the previous verse, Jesus opened the book and he found the place where it is written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. He gave it again to the minister and sat down. Now he didn't sit down in the congregation and to be silent. It says he sat down. The eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. So he's still inside of everybody. He didn't go to the back row and sit down. He's still inside of everybody. He sat down And he began to say unto them. Now, if you begin to say, that means you go on saying, right? He began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. So in other words, that was his opening text. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me. His opening text was about how the Holy Spirit had been placed upon him because God had anointed him to fulfill this assignment. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whenever Jesus went into a city, he began preaching this same concept that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Do you remember that Brother Hagin had a visitation and the the, the Lord Jesus Christ personally put his hands on brother uh, fingers on brother Hagen's hands and imparted healing anointing to brother Hagen and gave him instruction how to work that anointing how to pray for people correctly with that anointing 
In the beginning, he said, when you lay your hands on them, if you feel the power jump from, one, from your hand to the next, like you've got your hand on the front and you've got the hand on their back, if you feel the power go between, it's the presence of an evil spirit working and you need to take authority over that, that demonic a- affliction in their body. And, and then he instructed him, when you get ready, now this is different than just laying hands on the sick and they shall recover. He said, you minister the anointing to them and you tell them that I laid my hands upon the, my fingers in the palms of your hands. You tell them you have this visitation and you tell them that I imparted this anointing into your hands before you pray for them. Why? Because their faith in the fact that God had anointed Brother Hagen with that healing anointing, he wanted them to have faith in it. So it had, you, how does faith come? Hearing? Yes. Hearing. So he said, you tell them before you pray for them. And he did. Yeah. He would say, the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and he put his hands, and he put his fingers in the palms of my hands. He ministered this anointing. And when I pray for you, I'm going to minister the anointing to you. Yeah. I'm not just going to pray the prayer of faith. When he felt the anointing lifting, when he felt that, it, that it, it, he had prayed for, there would be times he would pray for so many people, he said, the anointing is lifting off of me. Yeah. But I can pray the prayer of faith for you. And he would pull those people over and pray the prayer of faith. That was different than the ministering of the anointing. But notice, he had to declare it. Right. And that's what Jesus was doing. He would go into these towns and he would say, the anointing is upon me. And the people who believed it, they wanted to touch him. They, they received of it. Now let's look at some examples of how the anointing is working for him to fulfill this ministry. Matthew 4 now, let's look at verse 23. How did Jesus administer this anointing? What did he say he was anointed to do? Preach the gospel, heal the sick, right? And so verse 23, Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He was teaching, preaching, and healing. That's how the anointing was flowing. Now, Luke 5 and verse 17. Luke 5, 17 And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem as he was teaching and the power of the Lord was present. So he was teaching and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. He was teaching And the anointing, the power, the anointing, the power was present. Why? Because he was anointed to teach them. As he was teaching, the anointing was present. Hallelujah. So listen, we don't have to have bouncing off the walls for the power to be present. There are times and we will definitely bounce. We We will have that clamorously foolish uh, uh, expression of praise to God, uh, but we don't have to have that for the power to be present. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 6, and let's look at 17 through 19. Next chapter, Luke six seventeen, and he came down with them and stood in the plain in the company of his disciples and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him. Why did they come? They came to hear him and to be healed. So they didn't come just to be healed, but they knew that in the hearing, in the hearing, they came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And they, that, why? Because he was anointed to preach. That's the, the declaration. He was anointed to proclaim, to preach. And they that were vexed with unclean spirits, they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went virtue. That word is dunamis. 
dynamic, explosive, miracle-working power went from him and healed them all. Glory to God. Glory to God. God. Jesus is participating with this anointing that is upon him for this assignment. Luke 7, 11. And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him and much people. Now, when he came near to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had to her, weep not. And he came and touched the bier, and they that were with him stood still. And he said, young man, I say unto you, arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The anointing at work in Jesus. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, who went about doing good. He was doing good. John 7 Verse 37, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow, or his innermost being, the Amplified says, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. He said, he that believes on me shall have this flow. He that believes on me shall have this same flow. Glory to God. Glory to God. So it's not, Jesus isn't the only anointed one. He is the anointed one, but we're in him. We are of him. He's the vine. We're the branches. We're connected to him. And the anointing flowing on him, through him, is flowing to us and on us and through us. Glory to God. Praise God. This is the plan of God. God doesn't want you to do anything alone. He wants you to do everything with him. He doesn't want you to to attempt any of his work just in your own power. He wants to put his power on your power and work with you. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 12, and we'll close here. 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry. Uh, 12, 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man. Now, when we say every man, we understand that he's talking to the brethren here. Verse 1 says brethren. So to every believer, you could say accurately. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every believer, to profit with all. To profit with all, to have have, uh, something to offer. Hallelujah. The manifestation of the Spirit, we, we need to believe that. You need to believe that you're anointed. Why? Because you're in Him. You are anointed, not just the pastor. The pastor's not the only anointed one in the building. The fivefold ministry people are not the only people anointed in the body. The body's anointed. God wants every believer operating in his anointing. Hallelujah. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man. Verse 11, all these, talking about these different gifts of the Spirit, and we know that these are a result of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, all these work by by the one 
and the self-same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So the Holy Spirit is the one who is working through us. He's the anointing upon us because the Holy Spirit is upon us because God has anointed us. The Holy Spirit works these gifts. We don't work the gifts. He works the gifts. We are the vessels he's working with. We're the instruments he's working through. We're the machinery. He's the power on the machinery. This, This keyboard, this is a keyboard that has great potential. But until Minister King touches the strings, or the strings, touches the instrument and, and causes the right sounds to come out of the instrument and the right chords and the right keys. The, by itself, even when it's plugged in, it's not doing anything. Yeah. But when he begins to operate this instrument, when the Holy Spirit begins to operate our, us as an instrument, right. hallelujah, then he's, it's his, his expertise on our keys, Amen. bringing out the right words to say, the right way to minister the anointing to that person. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then finally, verse 27, now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. Hallelujah. You are the body of Christ. You are the body. Remember, this is not talking about his last name. You are the body of the anointed one. You are the body of his anointing. Jesus' anointing is in this earth today through his people. That's why when we sing, it changes the atmosphere. The presence of God comes into manifestation in response to our praises because we are his anointed ones. We are, his, we are the carriers of his anointing. His power is on the earth through us. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. Did you receive tonight? Yes. Praise God. We'll, we'll pause here and see where we want to go more with this in the future. But before we dismiss tonight, we want to honor the Lord in our tithe and in our offering. If you are giving of your tithe and offering tonight, we have a safe and secure link at buildfaith.net. You can also use the text to give information on the screen And we um, have offering envelopes available for you in the pocket of the chair in front of you. We're so excited about what God is doing in faith builders and through faith builders to touch the world, to minister to people. Glory to God. Is anybody tuned in to our channel 20.2? It's an antenna channel. And if you... Uh, tune in. You might find a bilingual service because uh, pastor is preaching a lot of the messages on there. And so uh, it's, uh, our, it's our bilingual Hispanic channel that's preaching the gospel 24 hours a day throughout, not only the region around Little Rock, but also in Fayetteville and Springdale, Arkansas. Great. So we're covering a huge part of the state. Glory to God. And we are always honored to be a part of VTN. Now listen, tomorrow, uh, Pastor Steele is continuing on effective prayer number five. And so uh, five, uh, part five of this 12-part series, we have the study guide available in the bookstore. We have the mp3 flash drive of it available in the bookstore if you want to purchase those resources but you can watch it free after it airs on vtn you can find it on youtube channel and then it'll be released in our podcast channel as well so partake of those teachings because we're really growing in our effectiveness in prayer through this this teaching praise god as we prepare to give today stand with me to your feet let's come rejoicing Oh, the Lord is so good. On the 21st of this month, Pastor Caldwell and Sister Jeannie will be with us. That is Sunday night, April the 21st at our 6 p.m. service, and we're excited about 
that opportunity to receive of our, our pastors. Hallelujah. Father, we honor you tonight. What a blessing you are to us, Lord, as we honor you with our gifts of love, our tithe, our offering to you, Lord. We give you thanks for the blessing and the multiplication that your word has, has promised to be effective in our life. As we give, it is given unto us, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, sir. Praise God. Stand with me to your feet. Let's declare our vision tonight. The vision of this church will always be to build people's faith, to frame their world by the word of God. You and I will always be world changers. God bless.